Welcome back, everybody. So it's quarter past, so it's time to get our next talk started. And this is, I'm, I'm intrigued that everybody's here because apparently on the monitor there, it still says this is like a secret talk title. But um, I, it's, 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 it's my privilege, really, to be able to announce the title of this talk, which is Vector Search, Powering the Next Generation of Applications. Um, and we have, uh, you're a, a product lead, aren't you? Um, yes. my, uh, could we please have a big round of applause for Ben Flast? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for, for being here. I'm really excited to be uh, talking about vector search today. My name is Ben Flast. I'm a product manager at MongoDB. Been here for about four years working on a, a range of services in kind of the analytics and AI space. Um, I'm just going to quickly start out, though, with uh, a couple of questions. So. I'm, I'm curious if you've ever kind of found yourself looking for something but haven't quite had the words. Um, maybe you've, you know, remembered some characteristics of a movie but not the name. Or maybe you've been trying to get a sweatshirt that you had back in the day uh, and you have a picture but you don't know how else to look for it. Uh, or maybe you're looking to power an artificial intelligence with some long-term memory that could take over the world in the future. Or, and, and maybe you're just looking for an interesting talk to see at mongodb.local. If, if any of these things have kind of crossed your mind, then I think you might be at the right talk. Um, and so we're going to be talking about vector search. Um, but we're actually going to start by kind of going a, a bit back and, and talk about what a vector is and kind of orient to some of the concepts that you need to have in order to, to use this capability. Um, then we'll talk about the capability that we're releasing and, and how it works. Uh, we'll follow up by covering some use cases, uh, and then go through a demo uh, where you can actually see it in action in Slideware. Um, and then we'll finish up by talking about uh, what's next. So what is a vector? Uh, a vector is a numeric representation of data and related context. And so if you take a very simple example, like a quick brown fox, it would be a, a kind of a array of floats, um, which represents both the data, so the words, a quick brown fox, uh, but also kind of the context, how A relates to fox, you know, what does brown mean? Uh, fox is not a dog, it's also not a cat. Things like this would be the associated context that could be represented inside of this vector. So, Obviously, that's a very powerful concept to be able to represent so much inside of just this string of numbers. You're probably kind of immediately asking yourself, how would you get a vector? Uh, and the way that it works is that you would pass your data, whether it be an image or text or audio, through an encoder of some sort. And, and these are machine learning models that basically take this data and transform it into this numeric representation. We're going to go deeper into what this means and, and how it works later on. But this is just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. So once you've taken data and transformed it into a vector, there are some really interesting properties about these vectors that allow us to provide the service that we're releasing today. And, and kind of a key one is that similar vectors that are plotted in space will be near one another in this high dimensional space. And so to take a very simple example, if we have kind of a graph in two dimensions, and there are going to be a bunch of two-dimensional graphs that I'm going to show during this presentation, it's important to realize that while two-dimensional graphs are great for kind of showing this concept and understanding what's happening, all of the vectors that we're talking about here are really high-dimensional, right? We're talking about thousands of dimensions, which are really you know, impossible to visualize. And so we'll just stick in a two-dimensional world, but kind of keep that, again, in the back of your mind, because that's really where a lot of the power comes from with this next generation of, of vectors and capabilities. So continuing on with the example, imagine you have a point, and let's say that this point represents man, and there's a, there's a vector associated with it. Um, you could also have another point that represents the word woman, and it would be conceivable that those two pieces of text, when vectorized or embedded, those are you know, synonyms, would find themselves near one another. They would be close together in this high dimensional space because they are semantically similar, right? They have similar meanings. So they're both people or humans, et cetera. This is kind of a core concept that allows us to provide the service of vector search. If this didn't happen, if this didn't come about because of the way that these 
pieces of data are embedded and modeled, then it wouldn't be possible for us to provide this service. So that's super exciting. But if you zoom back out again and you say, here I have a bunch of circles. If again, I put them on a graph, I now can kind of think of them as you know, vectors in space. And we're noticing that they actually kind of cluster together. So these could be a bunch of different points, maybe movies in some database. And it's conceivable that if you took those movies and embedded the data about them, their plots, you would see that they would show up near one another. And so that's kind of what we're seeing here. And because they show up near one another, we're actually able to draw interesting information from them. But what's kind of core about that information that we're able to draw from them is how they relate to each other. And the way that we determine these relations is kind of through two things. One is how they get embedded, so what the model takes that source data and turns it into in a, a high dimensional vector. And then also, how do we calculate the distance between these vectors? So to imagine an example here, if we had man and woman, and we had king and queen as concepts, with one embedding model, one way of representing this data, along with one way of determining the distance, we may find that man and king have a shorter distance and, and are more semantically similar, and woman and queen are more semantically similar, right? That could be produced by having one embedding model and one distance function. And again, we'll get into those details a bit further in a second. But simultaneously, you could also have a different embedding model and use a different distance function that would result in actually man and woman being closer together and more semantically similar and king and queen being more semantically similar. So this is another way that that is kind of determined, which then impacts exactly what happens during vector search. And again, just to reiterate, because I know people are kind of milling in, we're laying the groundwork for vector search and you know, how this ends up kind of uh, impacting the service that we end up offering. So, We've talked about vectors, how they relate to one another, how they end up falling in this high dimensional space. When it comes to then using these vectors, there are some other important concepts that we need to know. And so we already talked about the fact that like data, when transformed into vectors, can create these clusters that are semantically similar. So groups of data that have some sort of relevance or, or reference or relationship between them. The, uh, K nearest neighbor is a way to go and search through these vectors. That is an algorithm that lets you kind of look at these vectors and find neighbors to them. And K represents the number of neighbors you're looking for when you talk about them. And so K nearest neighbors is a way to look through vectors uh, to find similar ones to a target. When you use K nearest neighbors, you have to define a specific similarity function. And so in Atlas Vector Search, we support three. Uh, there are more that you can use out in the market, but, but these are kind of the, the three most popular ones. The first one is Euclidean distance, which represents the distance between the ends of vectors. Um, the next is cosine, which represents the angle between vectors. And the third is dot product, which is based on both the angle between the vectors and the magnitude. Each one of these functions is good for a different type of use case. And so Euclidean, for instance, is really good for dense data where specific values matter. So for instance, if you wanted to do image similarity, it's really important that this pixel looks just like this pixel. That, that would be a good example of where Euclidean would be relevant. Another option would be cosine, right? And that's where sparse data and orientation is important. And that's kind of complex, but what it really gets down to is if you had examples like text concepts or themes that you wanted to be able to find the distance between, cosine is really good for that because maybe one word can represent a lot about what a paragraph is about more than having like several words repeated. So that's where cosine is good. And then dot product is really good for sparse data where both the orientation and the intensity matter together. So, once you've decided you're going to use k-nearest neighbors as an algorithm, you know that you're going to use a, a certain type of distance function. The way that all of this kind of becomes a reality is we have to be able to find this information very quickly. And the way this is done is with something called approximate nearest neighbor and uh, what's called a hierarchical navigable small world graph. Now, that's a lot of words, but it's actually you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, 
approximate nearest neighbor basically takes an approach to finding the nearest neighbors, just like k nearest neighbors does, but it does it in an approximate manner, obviously, which prioritizes speed over accuracy. And what I mean by that is, at the margins where we're figuring out does, does this vector fit as a neighbor, you could kind of drop those outliers out, and that's really what the approximate is getting at. So you're not going to get necessarily all of the nearest neighbors, but again, you're going to get the majority. And this is really kind of happening at the margins. And what this allows for is a really fast traversal of these vectors so that you can find semantically similar concepts quickly, which is obviously very important within the concept of a operational database. So those are all the basics. <laughs> so you're all oriented to vector search. You understand more about vectors. Um, there's one other concept prior to talking about the feature itself that I wanted to cover. Um, and that's kind of why now. Um, so vector databases have been around for a long time. And we've had vector search inside of MongoDB for actually a very long time in the form of geospatial data. Those can be thought of as two-dimensional vectors that can be searched for other near vectors. But what's different now is that we're looking at vectors in very high dimensional space. And with the strategy that I just talked about on the prior slide, we know why we're able to look through them fast, but we don't know yet why these high dimensional vectors are able to represent data so well. And, and that really comes down to recent evolutions in machine learning and that ECODER model that I talked about much earlier. So pre-2000, we had approaches to, to modeling data in vectors that would use manual feature engineering um, with you know, strategies like bag of words and, and TF-IDF. The next evolution over that was something like word to vec and glove, you know, word to vec coming out of Google, a way to represent text in vectors. Um, what followed that in 2013 was you know, something called the contextual word embeddings. Uh, these kind of added a bit more, allowed you to model even more data within your vectors. And then this was followed in 2018 by a paper about transformers that came out of Google and the associated BERT models and GPT that allowed you to represent really contextual information inside of your vectors. And this is kind of where a sea change really occurs and vectors become extremely powerful. What we've seen since then is in 2020, large transformers come about representing a ton of contextual information inside of your vectors. And finally, in 2023, GPT-4 and specialization that have led to just even more powerful ways of representing data inside of vectors. And this is what leads us to today, where vector search becomes an extremely powerful capability because you're able to represent so much semantic data inside of these high dimensional vectors. So that's it for the background. Um, moving on to vector search as a capability. Um, the way this works is you and your client, right, uh, and the client being the application, would send your data through an encoder and then write that vector along with your data into vector search, right? So you keep your vectors with your data and write them into the database. And then on the read side, you go and you encode your query and submit that in a dollar search stage along with your target vector and submit it to vector search to find neighbors. That's, it's really that simple. Um, the way it ends up getting modeled inside of your documents, right, is that the vectors sit right alongside the data that they vectorized. So in kind of this typical document I'm describing up here, you could have something like, you know, the, the date, the year, regular kind of MongoDB document fields, and then you would have a content field, some you know, big uh, unstructured text string, and then alongside it you would have a content underscore embedding field, and that would have the array, which is a array of floats, which is the number of dimensions in your vector. The more dimensions, uh, more floating point numbers. Those are one and the same for MongoDB, and it sits right alongside your data. Once you've done that, you'll go and define an index definition. The way you define the index definition is you go into our definition builder, you would select uh, you know, the JSON configuration, and you would insert an index that looks just like this. It's at this point that you say it's a, a KNN index. You tell us how many dimensions you're using in your data, and then you choose your similarity function. You choose your similarity function when you build the index. Um, and again, it would be either Euclidean, dot product, or cosine. Once this is done, 
you're done. The index is built in the background. You don't have to do anything else to sync data, to communicate changes between your data and this new vector search capability. You can just use your new dollar search query, which includes a KNN beta operator, and provide the vector that you're looking for, which is derived from sending your text or image or audio through an embedding model that provides your target vector. You provide the path to where those vectors live inside of your documents. And then you can include a filter, which is going to be a pre-filter that filters data out at query time, and K for the number of neighbors. And so K is you know, how many you want back, similar to a, a limit inside of MongoDB. Uh, the way to think about the filter, by the way, is you are looking for semantically similar data, sure, but maybe you have some hard requirements about that data. For instance, maybe you're looking for super delicious, amazing Chinese restaurants in you know, New York City. Super delicious, uh, you know, that's you know, contextual. Uh, New York City, that is a filter, right? You just want things in New York City. So the filter is important because it's going to filter as we find these neighbors based on the contextual side of things. So this is really helpful to make sure that queries are both very efficient and fast, but also only providing relevant data. And so these get combined inside of the, the stage. So with that, that's how vector search works. But I want to kind of emphasize some of the benefits here. So for those of you familiar with you know, competitive products that are doing vector search at the market, one thing you have to do is you have to sync data back and forth from your operational store into your vector search capability. You have to continually vectorize it, keep it aligned. And, that, and that's, that's a tax, right? It, it takes a lot of time. Uh, it, it can be brittle. You have to maintain it. With Atlas Vector Search, data is automatically synchronized between the database where it's stored and the vector index that lives right alongside it. You get to work with your data, both in the database for your operational workloads and your semantic search workloads using a single MongoDB query API. And you have a fully managed offering so you can just focus on building the application. This is really the power of vector search when it comes to MongoDB. But in addition to that, it's also important to remember that Atlas Vector Search is available on top of a battle-tested platform that allows you to run anywhere. And so I'm sure you've seen this diagram before, but again, I would be remiss to not mention the fact that Vector Search is landing inside of a context that is very secure, private, comprehensive security controls. It has the ability to run in over 100 different regions, can be deployed in three different clouds, um, and allows you to take the best from any cloud provider. This is actually a really important point with vector search in particular. This space is moving so fast. New models are coming out every week. The leaderboards are continuously changing about what's the best way to represent your data. So having a multi-cloud offering that allows you to take advantage of models in whatever cloud becomes the best is going to be extremely powerful and meaningful as this continues to evolve. Um, and it really frees it up and, and connects it to the open source. And then lastly, you end up with a continuous uptime and you know, guaranteed performance that you know and love within Atlas. So all of these things are such huge benefits of including vector search within the context of MongoDB. And the last thing that I'll just mention is that what undergirds all of this is that your vectors live inside your documents. As we've said for a really long time, the document model is the superset model. It can model and contain you know, data of a variety of models. And with vector search, we're just doubling down on that. Another thing comes in and lives with your operational data and makes it accessible for a new use case inside of the platform. So we've talked about how it works, how you set up. Um, now I want to quickly cover a few use cases that we're seeing out in market. So there are some classic use cases like semantic search, the ability to search for data based on meaning rather than textual search, looking for keywords or, or, or the like. There's the use cases for question and answer systems that we see. Um, some of these were talked about up on the stage earlier. We see feature extraction when you kind of dive into more machine learning type use cases. We also see recommendations and relevance scoring being popular, as well as synonym generation and image generation. What's really powerful is that almost any kind of data can be represented as a vector, and therefore you can do search over any kind of data. The last bit, though, that I want to cover is LLM memory. So a lot of you are probably hearing about large language models. There's uh, a ton of news and excitement about that. We've, we've heard about some innovations that have come out recently. And they are an extremely powerful capability that we're really excited about. And 
one of the things that's so excited about them is that they have this kind of ability to provide a, you know, understanding and analysis of unstructured data similar to what we want to store inside of MongoDB. But one of the kind of Achilles heels of large language models is that they are trained on data up until a point. And this means kind of three things for us. One is that if things have happened after that model has been trained, it does not know about them. Sometimes also they are just going to find the wrong information inside of their internal representations. And lastly, they should never have access to your private data, right? Um, and so those three kind of Achilles heels are really where vector search kind of comes in to the use case that is large language memory. Um, and the way it does that is by augmenting this capability with the vector store to provide the memory or facts or ground truth that can reduce hallucinations, provide up-to-date information, and provide access to your private information. The way that this gets done is using what's called a retrieval architecture, which I'm going to talk about now. I'm just going to grab a sip of water. Oh. Mm. So, retrieval architectures. With large language models accessing data inside of vector search, the way that this works is the client submits an inquiry. That gets processed by a framework, which I'll cover in more depth in a second. That inquiry goes to the large language model. The large language model uses semantic search to pull out the relevant data from the database, and then return it for post-processing and go back to the client. The way this is done frequently is using frameworks. And, and that's why I'm really excited to kind of talk about some of our partners in the space who are making a lot of this possible. And so we're excited to have you know, Langchain, LamIndex, MindsDB, and Nomic all partnered with us uh, because of all of the exciting work that they're doing in this space. And so Langchain and Llama Index, if, if you're not familiar, are ways to set up uh, and interface with large language models, as well as give those large language models an ability to connect to uh, vector search capabilities. MindsDB is a really exciting company that's bringing machine learning closer to the database and making it more accessible to developers than ever before. And Nomic is a company that is doing visualization on top of vectors. Because one of the things that you might have thought you know, during some of our earlier discussion is that while you can understand what the content string looks like, the minute you embed it as a vector, it becomes harder to understand how things relate to one another and what they mean and, and how they're powerful. And so Nomic is really kind of revolutionizing some of the things in that space. So. Uh, now to dive into a demo uh, through Slide. So the way that this works inside of Atlas is you would have a document such as uh, you know, a movie, right, inside of a movie's collection. And you would take that document, which has genre, directors, and it has a plot. You would take that document and take the plot and send it through an embedding service, usually some API. Um, and this can all be done using Atlas triggers inside of the platform. And you pass it in in the input field, uh, the plot, which is just the string. The result from this, based on the model you choose, is going to be an embedding that you then tuck back inside of your documents just like so. So you have plot, and then you have plot underscore embedding, which is your, your series of floats that represents your vector. Once you've done that, you'll see that data can relate using those vectors. And this is an example of a screen from Nomic. And you know, pardon the, the sizing, um, but what you'll notice is this is actually a collection of 25,000 movies. And you'll see there are a bunch of tiny points all over the place. Uh, but I've highlighted two of them that are somewhat close to one another in a high dimensional space. And you'll see the title of one is uh, A Song to Remember, and the title of the other is Symphony of Life. And so I haven't seen these movies, and I don't know what the plots are. But just based on the name alone, you can see that these are, you know, probably quite similar. Uh, and it's amazing to see that they kind of line up you know, close by one another in this you know, high dimensional space. So once that's done, you would then use a aggregation in the form of dollar search to target the index that you've built for your vector index, submit the embedding of the query that you have, and then tell us where inside of the documents the embeddings live and the number of neighbors you'd like. 
Once that gets submitted, you'll get the results. Um, and so I did a couple tests of this uh, to show you. And so I took an embedding of The Lord of the Rings and submitted it against this 25,000 document collection. And the results that I got were, were these. So the first one is Ringers, Lord of the Fans, which is a documentary about Lord of the Rings. The second one I got is The Fellowship of the Ring. The third is The Return of the King. The fourth, I think, is a box set, The Lord of the Rings. And the fifth is The Hobbit. And so what's happened here is we've taken data, we've taken the text, The Lord of the Rings, and we've turned it into a high dimensional vector. And it turns out that all the vectors that are nearby that are exactly the type of movies that we would be looking for. So this is kind of an amazing concept that you know, brings back this semantically similar data. But I don't know that this actually kind of shows the, the true power, because you could have done this with text search, right? So some simple matching of fields, the Lord of the Rings presumably finds itself in all of these results. And so I took another example for the same collection, and I typed in an embedding of this sentence, which is a movie with the feeling of the color green. And while there are no MongoDB movies, which most assuredly would have showed up, uh, I did get some really interesting results. Uh, so the first one was a fantasy, an animated film drawn entirely in pastels uh, uh, about plant-like things that grow, uh, a film about utopia, a film that takes place in the countryside of Thailand, and then somehow at the very end, Chuck Norris vs. Communism. So I don't really know what is so green about that last movie, but I can see in the first three results exactly what's so green about them. And so that is kind of just the crazy power of this new capability and the ability to search on top of uh, or using semantic concepts. So that was kind of a simple search example, though. I wanted to kind of also just you know, pique your interest and kind of maybe stimulate some of your imagination around what this might look like within the context of a large language model. And so we have this example that we've had a lot of fun with internally, which is Imagine you're looking for a movie and you submit a query like the following. I'm looking for a recent movie with a bit of action, some sci-fi, happy ending, and kung fu. Uh, can you give me some, some options? Uh, if you were to submit this to an LLM, you might get an ex example response such as the following. Uh, sure, I can't give you anything recent uh, since my knowledge is cut off in 2021, but uh, I would recommend Kung Fu Hustle. It has some action, fantasy, happy ending, etc. It's a good movie. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's very fun. It, it is you know, uh, a fantasy movie, not really a, a sci-fi movie, but it does have kung fu. So that's pretty good. But if you, and the way that this would end up looking inside of your application is something like the following, right? You would take your client, you would submit your question to a framework, maybe something like Langchain or Llama Index. It would take the question that you've asked, maybe add some additional context to it, create a prompt, and send that to the large language model which would then respond with a raw response, which you might do some post-processing on and get back to the client. This is what kind of the experience of using ChatGPT looks like today, right? But if instead you used a retrieval architecture for that large language model, you might ask the same question, but instead get an answer like this. Sure, based on the movies I have access to via the database that you just saw a couple minutes ago, everything everywhere all at once would be a good option, right? It has everything you're looking for. It's sci-fi, not fantasy. It's got a happy ending, and it's won a ton of Oscars. So this is obviously a better answer. The way something like this would end up working is a bit more complex, but adds a ton of value. So you might have the client send in the question, which is just kind of the raw question of what they're looking for. The framework is going to take that question and use it to do the semantic search. Once it gets back to that contextual data that it wants to augment your prompt with, it will take that data and send it all together over to the large language model, both what you're looking for along with kind of this context that it pulled from the vector search. Once that's done, it sends back the result for post-processing, goes through the framework, and it goes back to the client. And that's how you end up with a response that has a lot more value um, and more recent information to provide back to the customer. So this kind of brings me to the very end of my presentation, where I want to just talk a bit about what's next. So we're thrilled about the partners we have in this space. We're thrilled about the capability that we're releasing today. We are really excited to get it into customers' hands in a uh, public preview state um, so that we can get your feedback and understand what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to see less of. Um, and so what we already know we're going to be doing uh, is improving the overall interface, improving performance, uh, 
deepening our relationships with partners, uh, both on the embedding side of things, make it easier to create your vectors, uh, do more with our uh, framework partners, uh, and really deepen the relationships and just build this further into the developer data platform that you already know and love. Um, and so that's where our, our thoughts are now. And just because this is such an interesting and new topic, I did want to make sure to take plenty of time to do a Q&A. And so I'm going to stop, and we'll do Q&A. Yeah, a big round of applause for Ben, please. That was awesome. Thank you. I, I've learned stuff in that that I've been trying to learn for a while, so that's already been super useful for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, if anybody in the audience has a question, please stick your hand up. If there's somebody in the front row, I will come and bring you a microphone. Hey, Niket from Laurel. Um, how should companies think about storing vector data in addition to the data they already have in terms of cost? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you probably noticed what you're storing is an array of floats. And that's not the most efficient, uh, but we are looking at ways that we can improve that over time. Um, so the, the reality is that it's going to be one vector per document, so it should be a relatively small uh, kind of inflation of your overall document size to store the vector. Um, but it is important to keep that in mind. Um, and it, it will lead to other effects on your data, right? Um, the things that kind of come to mind uh, for that is, you know, you, you certainly won't want to present it back to users. Uh, it's going to be useful inside the context of your, your cluster. Uh, but because we've decided to expose this as a core primitive of BSON, which is an array, you can actually manipulate these vectors. And you can actually use them uh, in addition to using the vector search that you consume them with. So there are, there, there's optionality through the fact that we've put it inside of a standard BSON uh, type. Um, but it is important to keep those concerns in mind as you scale. Any more questions? We had lots of hands up. I'm going to go over here. Hi. Uh, can you explain how this vector data database is going to solve this uh, hallucination problem associated with this uh, uh, generative AI large language model? Yeah. So the question was about how can uh, vector databases uh, vector search help solve the hallucination challenge of Ellen's? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's pretty aligned with the diagram I showed earlier. But fundamentally, large language models, if you just give them a random question with not that much direction, they will you know, spit back something you know, that is not that polished. What vector search allows you to do is to structure that further right, with additional information. So not only should you be thinking about you know, asking large language models with a lot of context about you know, show your work, you know, uh, you, you're an expert, providing context that, that you can do because of your use case. But the benefit of vector search is you can also say, and look for the answers inside of this database. Right? That's, that's kind of the concept. So I, let's you know, take, for example, I want a movie recommender bot. I only want to recommend movies from the last two years. You know, the language model is not going to know anything about movies from the last two years. So I'm going to tell it to use the vector search as its ground truth. And so I don't want you to give me answers based on what you know. I want you to use vector search to tell me what I have told you. So that, that's kind of the concept. And all of that is done through these frameworks like Langchain and Llama Index. Uh. <laughs> So you build extra contacts to feed it into the large exactly. language model. Yeah. But then it's only going to be uh, reflected in the, the indexing, the similarity index that you put in, the contextual um, sort of embedding that you put in there. I couldn't quite hear that, but it, it is only then based on the data that's in the vector search, right? So it, it doesn't solve the problem in absence of you having context to provide it. So I have a question over here, maybe? Do we have a hand up? No? OK, so we had some hands up over here. Is that right? Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to see more close up on the vector search. Um, I know that the vector search uses a retrieval architecture, and I'm wondering if the architecture is open source or proprietary? Yeah, so the retrieval architectures is kind of a, 
like a general approach to, to solving this problem. Um, so it's uh, a way to architect using LLMs. So we don't have like a public architecture um, you know, that is available somewhere. But what we do have is support inside of the most popular frameworks inside of this place. So both Llama Index and Langchain have the concepts of large language models. They have the concepts of what are called chains or you know, Lang chains. Um, and these allow you to feed data into large language models in a structured manner. They also now have support for Atlas Vector Search as what's called the Vector Store. And so you can use Langchain to basically construct these prompts, which pull in the context from places like Atlas Vector Search. And that's the way that you would build this. And there's a, you know, a ton of content out in the market about this. Um, and we have tutorials that we've put out today. We also have, since we have support inside of these frameworks, there's documentation there in the form of Python notebooks that show you how to set all of this up. Um, and it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, a lot of like, excellent content out there that does effectively show you how to build a retrieval architecture. You're welcome. Hello. So just uh, on the same note, uh, <clears throat> so in this like, application, are you really interacting with the Mongo or like with the Langchain, uh, the example that you showed? In this, in this architecture that I described, Langchain is a framework that lives inside of your application. So it's in your app code. And you are interacting with MongoDB through Langchain okay. for this, this specific use case. OK. And the second thing is that uh, on the size, I think the question like the uh, about the size of the vectors and storing that in the in like they will base on, is it just the are you storing the embedding uh, vectors just for the document itself, or can you give the broader context? For example, if this document is the MongoDB document is just the like just the metadata of a document living in like the S3, can you also then uh, create the embedding for the actual like the PDF or the or like? Yeah. the unstructured file and include that with the embedding of the actual metadata. So you can absolutely do that. that. That's a fairly frequent use case for MongoDB, which is basically storing metadata about files that you store in S3, but having kind of the catalog and metadata of that inside of MongoDB. This works somewhat similarly uh, in, in a certain context, which is you are storing the vector itself inside of your documents. Uh, and you can store up to uh, 2,048 dimension wide vectors in your documents. Uh, that is built into an index, which is referring back to that document. You could, at that point, link from that document to uh, you know, an object in S3. So, so it's absolutely possible to do that with like large files and such. But we do see a lot of interest from customers about actually you know, using the power of the 16 megabyte document limit, limit to actually store your files inside of MongoDB that you, know, you want to actually retrieve using similarity search. So there's a range that you, can, that you can do there. But this is one of the things that we're so excited about, which is the flexibility to store the vectors directly in your documents. You don't need to kind of separate them from, from the, met, the metadata. And more importantly, you don't even need to separate them from the data, right? It, it ends up in the same document. Any more hands? Didn't see any hands, so I think we've run out of questions. Do you see any? Okay, so thank you very much. Can we have cool. another big round of applause for Ben?